It's my pleasure to welcome you. I'm Crystal Parikh. I'm the director of the Asian Pacific American Institute at NYU. Um, it's my pleasure to welcome you to our event tonight, the screening of two films um, uh, that are focused on the politics of incarceration and pers the personal effects um, of the prison industrial complex on our fellow New Yorkers as well as our fellow Asian Pacific Americans. Um, I'd like to uh, thank multiple, before we begin, I'd like to thank our multiple co-sponsors whose generous support has made this event possible. Um, these include the NYU Native Studies Forum, the NYU Native American and Indigenous Students, gr students Group, um, the NYU Prison Education Program, and Na Aoi NYC. I'd also like to thank our fantastic staff at the APA Institute whose hard work went into organizing this event. Um, our program will begin with a screening of After Now, um, a short film directed by Rachel Bosch and Thuy Lin Tu, who um, is a faculty member here at NYU as well, um, in collaboration with the NYU Prison Education Program. This documentary follows three New Yorkers as they rebuild their lives and relationships after incarceration. Immediately following After Now, we will present the evening's feature, Out of State. And then following the two screenings, we're delighted to present a panel discussion featuring out-of-state director Sierra Lacey um, via Skype, um, Max Mishler, who is at the University of um, Toronto, Earl Neal, who is an alum of the NYU Prison Education Program, and the discussion will be moderated by our own Dean Sarah Nilio, who is an assistant, oh, so, excuse me, so, assistant professor, soon to be associate, <laughs> and of the NYU Department of Social and Cultural Analysis. I'll give um, slightly fuller uh, bios for all of them after the screenings. Um, I'm going to turn the mic over now to Rachel, Rachel Bosch, who is the Associate Director of the NYU Prison Education Program, and she'll be introducing After Now, um, which she also co-directed and what she will introduce to us. So please join me, join me in welcoming Rachel. Um, very briefly, um, to introduce the film you're about to see, After Now, I need to first introduce you to the NYU Prison Education Program. Currently, NYU is offering an associate's degree to men incarcerated at Wall Hill Correctional Facility. The program's been running for three years. Um, it was founded by faculty, students, and staff here at NYU. And um, this film is a project that came out of the program, the very early stages of the prison education program, when we realized that uh, many of our students would soon be returning, specifically to New York City. And here at NYU, we're you know, in the middle of New York City. And we felt like one of the more important questions we had to ask ourselves is, how are we going to support students as they're transitioning home? So this film really um, was, I guess, kind of an experiment. Professor Chui Tu and I decided that we would start following three former NYU PEP students as they transitioned home and had to really grapple with um, having to start over and rebuild relationships and family dynamics. And what you'll see is that in three stories, there's a lot of um, nuances and differences. And so I think what we've learned from this film is that if you look at these three stories and think of it on a larger scale, you know, multiply it by a thousand, and you're starting to understand the devastating effects of incarceration on neighborhoods and communities and families. So um, please uh, feel free to give me your feedback about the film after the screening. Thank you so much. Now we are going to begin with the, um, the panel. So um, it's my pleasure to um, introduce our featured panelists for the evening. I'm going to keep my um, introductions very brief, but please do refer to your programs, which have much fuller um, descriptions and bi biographies of each of our um, speakers. So um, now also joining us on stage is Kaina Kenga from Na Oi, um, who will be greeting each of the panelists um, with lays when they come up to the stage. So, thank you. Okay, so um, our speakers uh, first is Earl Neal, better known as Brown Man, um, who's an alum of the NYU Prison Education Program, or PEP, and was part of its first, first cohort of students, and he's currently pursuing his BA. Next is Max Mischler, who's an assistant professor of history at the University of Toronto and postdoctoral fellow in the Society of Fellows at Columbia University. <laughs> Joining us by Skype is Sierra Lacey, who is a native Hawaiian filmmaker, the inaugural Sundance Institute Murata Mita Fellow, and current Princess Grace Awards Special Project grantee, and a 
<laughs> and of course, the director of um, our feature film, Out of Sea. We have her on the And moderating, um, excuse me. Moderating tonight's discussion is Dean Itsuji Saranilia, who is an assistant professor in the Department of Social and Cultural Analysis at NYU. All right, good evening, everyone. Can you hear me? Hear me right? Okay. Um, so before we begin, um, I wanted to acknowledge that we are on the traditional and ancestral territory of the Lenape people. And many Lenape peoples continue to live in Manhattan and in Lenape Hawking. And um, in the 18th century, many of the Lenape were displaced throughout various parts of the United States and into Ontario. Um, and uh, the Ramapo Lenape continue to live on their ancestral territory, but live um, at a, in a super fun site, which is to say that they actually live in a place uh, that um, leads to um, often to premature death but because of their connection to the land, they refuse to leave. And so this is where we are, and this is where this conversation is, is, being, is taking place. And, um, and so in that way, I, I guess um, I wanted to just ask uh, Sierra to start us off. And Sierra, if you could tell us a little bit about the process of making your film, um, how you came into making uh, a, a film um, about the afterlife incarceration, and maybe like, what were the challenges of, of making this film? First of all, I'd like to say um, aloha po mihana kako. Um, my gratitude to everybody for coming out tonight to see the film. Uh, this film only exists because the men that you watched on screen offered themselves and felt it important to tell their stories with you so that we can affect some form of understanding and change. So um, by you being here tonight, you've honored what they were hoping to do. So thank you to everyone for being here. Um, I had never been to a prison before we started this film. So I had zero understanding of, of what the system was like. The choice to make the film came from sort of an unusual standpoint. Um, I lived in New York for about 10 years. I'm a Native Hawaiian. I grew up and went to a high school for Native Hawaiians. I speak my language, I dance my dances, and um, I've been living and working in production in New York, and I got very sick. And uh, I couldn't work anymore, so I went back home, and while I was in recovery, uh, I had an auntie who was helping me with physical therapy. She would throw out ideas, you should make a movie about this, and you should make a movie about that, and I was like, I can't really do anything right now. And um, she tossed out one idea, which was, you know, our men are dancing hula at a prison in Arizona. And something about that really struck me. Um, the idea of our people so far away from home didn't make any sense to me. The idea of our culture behind bars didn't make sense to me. And so I reached out to my cousin, who at the time was a public defender, and who had represented a lot of men, like the men that you see in the film. He is also a Hawaiian, speaks a language, and has done a lot of work in the prison setting, um, and talked to him about this. And I found one video online of what the men were doing um, at Saguaro, and I cried. And I had this moment where I thought, you know, I don't know what it's like to be in prison, but I do know what it's like to wonder if you can come back from something. And for me, you know, it has been a journey into, into understanding what you really believe about a comeback, and do we truly believe in second chances? And I have had to check myself at every point along the way. Um, you know, to really understand what I, what, how I believe in and, you know, understand what the situation is like for people who are trying to reconnect with their home after being gone so far away for so long. Um, and so we, when we, we thought it would take us a year to get into the prison, it took us 10 days. Uh, so we had no money and no plan and we showed up. And the moment I walked in the door, the men, the men were practicing a cultural ceremony, and it was about 100 men in the prison rec yard, and they chanted us in, and all I could do was cry. And as a Hawaiian, I still chanted that. Um, but it launched what we thought would be a short film, and it just got longer because the idea of showing what, it, what you're finding your identity and finding your culture, that's one layer. Um, 
but I wanted to also make sure that people understood what the process was like once you get out. Um, there is a power to knowing who you are that inoculates you against a lot of things. Um, but, but truly, you know, what are the factors at hand and what is the personal experience at hand to, to understand whether or not that self-identification is enough to help you get through. So that was a long-winded answer, but that was for the journey got me Thank you, Sarah. It was, in my perspective, it was hopefully restorative for all of us. It was restorative for myself, and hopefully, you know, we're, we're doing good to kind of help the men as well find help for each other. You know, this is something I, I kind of think is what they had hoped to help their, their fellow brothers. And we can kind of help help push that forward. I wish you could see everyone's face in the audience, but everyone is nodding in agreement with you. And uh, so, thank you so much for for that answer. Um, you know, there's I'm trying to think about how to place the two films into conversation, and um, there's a different historical context to both films. And so, you know, for um, out of state, the U.S. occupation of Hawaii and the ongoing forms of settler colonialism that uh, displace native peoples from ancestral lands and also um, attempt to extinguish sovereign rights to Hawaii. And, um, and also these other forms of anti-blackness that manifest in ongoing histories of slavery and abolition. And so I guess I, I wanna know um, if we could just have a kind of conversation about what, how you see these histories sort of playing out in the films and are there connections um, between these different communities that you guys might wanna, wanna share or talk about? Um. Okay. Um, well, first, I just want to say thank you to the people that made those movies. Um, they're really important, and, and I have something to say about that, too. But I also want to do an acknowledgement. First, thank you for doing the First Nations acknowledgement. But I also want to acknowledge those people in the room and are part of this project who have been incarcerated. Mm -hmm. And one of the things we need to think about is how do those who have been incarcerated come to the forefront of these conversations about policy, about telling the stories, about how we move forward. Um, so I think it's important that we acknowledge that as well. Um, I think the other thing that is why these movies matter is I spend a lot of time telling people about statistics. And what's interesting is it doesn't have the impact we think it does. And you can show people graph after graph of how the US is the most incarcerated place on earth, how it's disproportionately uh, people of color, you can show them all those graphs, and what will surprise you is some people will just say, yeah, I guess we do have a large prison population. I guess people of color do commit crimes. The importance of telling these stories is that we put human faces to the tragedy, and we allow those people that are going through it to tell that story. That's the only way we're gonna change this. So I just wanna acknowledge the importance of these kinds of movies. Now to put on my <coughs> historian hat for a second. One of the challenges when you think about mass incarceration is that it reduces human beings to numbers. And in some sense, by flattening out those individual stories, it's also a flattening out of histories. And I guess I would say these movies were about different pathways home. And I'm just gonna talk maybe for two minutes about the different pathways to prison in a, in a historical sense. Because one of the interesting things when you think about the, you talked about the sort of anti-blackness as part of the fabric of American society, but so too is, as you mentioned, you know, the dispossession of Native Americans. And what's interesting is you can have very different kinds of racial formation projects, right? So in the United States, we have a one drop rule, right, for people of African descent. And that in some ways was a logic that was about bounding people in servitude. But then you have different rules about blood for native peoples, which was about dispossessing them of the land. And yet both of those trajectories, right, as we see from these movies, land us in a moment where people are being incapacitated in prison. And I think one of the ways that I was thinking about these movies is there's something about the history of slavery and freedom and a history of colonialism that really is about the duality of forced migration and keeping people in place. And the historian Walter Johnson talks about what he calls the carceral landscape of slavery, right? And one of the things about a carceral, and you could apply that to colonialism as well, right? It's forcing people to move when you need them to move, and then when you need them to stay put, designing a whole carceral apparatus to keep them there. And I think one of the things these movies do well is show the connections between the histories of slavery and anti-black racism, 
and the dispossession of Native peoples in particular in Hawaii, but I would add across the continent of the United States, right? If we looked at uh, Minneapolis or Arizona, you're gonna see similar dynamics with Native people there. Um, so I think there are a lot of ways to tie this history of U.S. settler colonialism and the history of racial chattel slavery and put them in the same frame. The last piece I'll say on that, which has sort of hit me today watching the two movies, the question of land, as you rightly point out, is so central to the Hawaiian story, but I would add that I think it's central to New York too. You have Hawaii as an island paradise for some, <laughs> based on the dispossession of the people that were there. But in New York, we have a similar process, right? We have a golden financial city where people are enjoying themselves in all kinds of ways, but it's built on the ruins, right, of 30-year assault on black and Latino communities. And there is a forced removal of people in New York City that made possible the city we have today. So again, the forced migrations, moving people from Brooklyn and the Bronx and Harlem to upstate New York resonates for me with the story of moving Native Hawaiian people from their homeland to a private prison in Arizona. So those are just some of the thoughts about the historical similarities. Europe. Deep, deep. That, um, that's a, um, I mean, he pretty much captured it all, but from, how should I say? Well, first of all, let's just, let's in the United States in, in general, we can come to the understanding that we know what the prison system is for the simple fact that you still have some prisons in the United States today that go by the name of the plantation that it used to be called. <laughs> so what does that tell you? That's a fact. This is, you, it used to be a plantation by that name, but now it's a prison by the same exact name. That's a fact. We know this, so we know the whole concept behind the prison system and what the prison system did for America in the sense of, of the slavery. And so we know that concept, but what I think the, the core of these two films is it allows people to stop for a second and stop listening to the news and stop listening to all the horrific things you hear about people that commit crimes and remember that <coughs> these are people. Yes. It brings humanity back to prisoners and it, it shows because you take in every, if you pay attention to all the different men in these films, including myself, we all come from a different background. We all had a different time stretch. We all went through something different, but at the end of the day, we all had either a family to come home to or a family to try to help raise or a family to try to be a part. So I think the the... One thing that both films capture is the humanity of regardless of whatever we do, let's not forget that these are people we are talking about. These are people that we are dealing with. These are people that do need a second chance. And I think that's the key core between the two movies. Um, I'm just gonna ask one, one last question and we'll like send it to the audience because I'm sure people have lots of questions to ask. Um, yeah, absolutely. Like this this film just really shows um, people who are trying to do right again. Like David at the end when he's mm. talking about using his culture and trying to be Pono and trying to, to live in a righteous way and at the same time the system is itself failing him, right? Like he's talking about how much he's getting paid, how much he has to pay for child support, right? All, all of these different kinds of things and you see at the end that he's, um, you know, he becomes houseless, right? And um, I know, Ciara, you've done uh, films about Pu'ohonua o Waianae um, and the homeless or houseless encampment in Waianae and the ways in which there are alternative ways of conceptualizing uh, ways of living on land that's not predicated on property. And um, um, so, Before you go on, just not to cut you off, just because you brung it up. The key in that is not only that he is, everything else is materialistic things because everyday people lose their homes. Everyday people go through all those things. The key is look at those men. They were in prison and I guarantee you they were more in touch with their spirituality. They were more in touch with their heritage, their roots than my, most people that were probably walking through Hawaii at that moment. They were human. They were in touch with who they were. And that shows you that these are people. Regardless of what crime they committed, it didn't matter because at one point in time, everybody has made a mistake. No matter what it was, we were given a second chance, no matter how it was. Just some people's mistakes are worse than others. And that all stems back to the road 
that they were led there. Mm -hmm. Slavery, it, it all, you know, it all, some people are forced into certain predicaments that lead them only in certain directions. Mm -hmm. What am I gonna do this morning when my kids have no food at all to eat? When am I supposed to look? I have three hungry bellies and nothing in the house to eat. Right. And I'm going to the store to steal a loaf of bread and it turns into something completely different. Mm -hmm. Now I'm locked up for 15 years for armed robbery that I went to the store to get a loaf of bread right. just because my family was hungry. When no provisions of me made in these communities. Like you have to look at the core of the people that are doing these times dial in these movies. They come from a background, they come from a heritage where they're not given a chance from the get go to make it somewhere in life. But they still remain human because they hold on to all their heritage, all their humanities, they're still people. And I think that's what touched me the most with out of state. It showed that no matter what happened, they remain human and they stay to their values. Earl, I'd like to thank you for saying that. And that was one thing that really meant a lot. It was like, you know, it didn't matter that David was home because he was still washing his clothes. He still, his sneaker, you know, like everything was, he still held on to that part of him that never let go. And I, I think the idea that there's a certain code of ethic in the prison thing, right? Everybody knows what you're doing. So you better live up to what you're saying that you're going to do because you're held accountable in that space, right? If you say you're going to do something, people will know if you do or you don't, and they're going to know what you were doing instead. And when you get out, you hold yourself to the same standard, to that accountability. And so the things that you and know, we're doing in terms of the consistent, you know, connection to culture and religion, you know, a certain code of ethic and behavior and conduct that they thought was right. You know, when you get out in the everyday world, you call somebody, sometimes they don't call you back. Yeah. Right? You say you're gonna do something, sometimes people don't do it. And the way that we engage in everyday life. You know, for the guys, a lot of times I would hear Holly tell me it's like, you know, number one, the struggle is real, but at number two, the disappointment. You know, the disappointment that it doesn't feel the same on the outside. You know, and that's part of that is in prison. You just you don't have the same thing. So the things that you do have, they're valuable, and you know, we take a lot of that for granted. Um, so I just you know I want to thank you for bringing that up because that was so key for a lot of the guys. You know. Like, how do I interact in this world where people don't hold themselves to the same standard and they might not hold it? Us in Hawaii, I was like, I don't practice makahiki. I'm a Hawaiian, I speak my language. I I don't practice makahiki every time. Right? That feels like something antiquated that's kept it in prison. And how, like, I had to check myself on that. Why is that only in prison? Why am I not doing that on the outside? So, you know, you're right, like, there is a difference. And, um, you know, there's something to be said for us from the outside looking in, knowing that these, you know, our own people were doing more culturally than we were, and we have all the freedom in the world, right? Yeah. So thank you. So I just ask one last question. Um, in the film, Out of State, you can see how, um, Holly, as an example, is wearing a Mauna Kea mm. tank top, right? It's just talking about the protection of Mauna Kea, one of the most sacred places in all of Hawaii. And um, a lot of them are wearing sovereign t-shirts. There's posters on the, on the walls of Ali'i, of the, of the Hawaiian royalty. And so there's, within that, this move for decolonization, right? And at the same time, in this long history of, of prison abolition, abolition is determined, you know? And so like there's, but there's a way in which abolition and colonization or decolonization is oftentimes imagined as the destruction of something, but as opposed to actually uh, replacing those things that currently don't work with something that could work better, right? And so I just wanted to hear a little bit just to, to again, make these kinds of connections about, about what the alternatives to incarceration are within like a kind of decolonial or within an abolitionist frame? Yeah, that's an excellent question, an urgent one. Um, I think maybe if I could build on what you guys were talking about briefly to answer it, I think it's important for us to also remember that we, we want to be very careful not to say the system is broken, right? We don't want to make the mistake of saying it's not working. 
that part of what we see in this movie is with the tragedy and travesty of human life because of mass incarceration is in some sense the smooth functioning of a system. You have to ask why a system is in place to know whether it's working or not. And one of the key parts of mass incarceration is civil degradation and civil death. And that goes with you after you're released from prison. And so to make sense too, right, is you're exactly what you were saying. It, in some ways, the choices you have, all these things are null and void when your actual status coming out of an institution is civilly dead or civilly degraded. Right? We need, and we need to think about the ways in which people are not just starting, the notion of starting anew, starting fresh, that almost doesn't capture it. You're starting below, right? And I think to answer your question, I'll be very blunt, we need to think about the abolition of prison. We need to think about decolonization. But as a historian of the 19th century, what I would caution us to be careful with is using words that, you, that are sort of large, capacious terms that can mean anything, right? So the problem with a word like abolition or decolonization, as much as I support it, is we haven't filled it in with the substance yet. And we've had moments of abolition in this country that haven't quite worked. And we've had moments of decolonization that haven't quite worked, not because people didn't have freedom dreams, but because what people were able to achieve in that moment was limited or the, what they were up against was too severe. So when we think about prison abolition, it's not enough to say, let's not have a prison. We have to think about what are the resources we're putting into communities to make sure they don't have to go to jail to learn about their culture, to make sure they don't have to worry about homelessness. Right? We have to think much more expansively. And I guess I'll finish by citing some, you know, Ruth uh, Gilmore is one of the sort of most important theorists and scholars of mass incarceration. And she says that prison abolition is not actually about the prison. It's about abolishing the society capable of having a prison. And I want us to think about that. It's complicated. There's a lot of people who are gonna say, I'm sure you've gotten this too, well, I don't know what we would do without prison. I'm not ready for that yet. That's a, that's a debate we can have, but something we shouldn't be debating or haggling over is that we can't have people who are going through a traumatic situation come home to no support. We can't have a society that sends traumatic, people who have been traumatized by a system back to a place with no support and then blame them when it doesn't work. So I think we need to imagine what that abolition is and start making a list. Is it basic income? Is it guaranteed health care? Is it free education? Is it affirmative action? Is it decolonization? Is it land? Is it, is it recognition of sovereignty in some cases? But I think we have to put the specifics in, or if we're not careful, we might actually get an abolition like we did in 1865 without getting an abolition, right? Um, yeah, I mean, first, yes. First of all, you're 100% you're right. Let me take off right away. The system isn't broken. You cannot say something is broken if it's still get, making progress. Let's, let's agree on that. The system isn't broken, but it's running like the New York City MTA system. <laughs> Point blatant. Like it, it's 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 jacked up, you know. You have you have young men committing their first crime, going away for ten years, for doing something that he should have probably gotten rehab for. You know, people make mistakes. So let's let's come to that understanding that you can't. And one thing with me and like how I love being at this blunt place where I can just speak and feel comfortable to be who I am. Let's keep it realistically. In this world. Not everybody came out 100% okay at birth. Right. So we have some people that might need to be held in a place, but even they deserve a second chance, whether it may be with medically, doctors continuously giving them assistance, but yeah. some people do need to be confined in a space until they can get the proper help to be released, which and that's what prison should be, but that's not what prison is. Prison is placing people in a cage and leaving them there until we think they're ready to be released. So when you release someone, um, any, plenty of pet owners in here, I already know it because New York City is the capital of pets. Go on vacation and lock your pets in the cage and come back and let the pet out and tell me what happens in the house. That's what the jail system is. You're locking someone up in a six by eight, leaving them there, and then just releasing them with no type of guidance and just telling them, yeah, we, 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 we rehabilitated you. Go do great out in the world. And the world probably didn't change drastically since they last seen it. 
Like, just to give you a joke, I was coming home in 2016, and we're doing something called Phase 3. This is to prepare us to come back to the world. <laughs> this is called Phase 3. The documentation and all the pamphlets, all the booklets that they were giving us in 2016 was from 1994. So what world were they preparing me to come home to? So the system is jacked up. So what we need to do, and, and I'm glad you brought this up, because one of my, like, a real goal of mine is, you know, it's a goal and it's a dream of mine, is to become a motivational speaker for a nonprofit that does all those things you just said. It gives just a second chance because at the end of the day, like I said, I'm blunt and I'm realistic. We can't afford to give second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, ninth chances. But what we can say is we make a platform is, listen, you made a mistake. We're willing to give you a place to lay your head when you come home. We're willing, to, is school you want to go back to? We're willing to help you get back into school. And here's this job placement. Even that furlong program, that's a great thing. That don't exist here no more. So guys don't even have a trade when they come home. So it's like, it's not about abolishing it. It's about reforming it and making it something that even if someone has to go through it, when they come out, they're a better person. Not just someone that comes out, and when they come out, we're all scared of them because they've been locked in a cage. So they're running around crazy. So it's more about reform and not about abolishing it. Um, so um, just to add along to what you guys have said, we have formed a program, a pilot program um, at Halaba Prison in Hawaii. It's a 10-part program in partnership with the Hawaii Council for the Humanities, where we have taken the film into, into the prison, and we screen the film, and we develop a process of conversation and, you know, brave and safe inquiry where the men can start to unpack their thoughts about reintegration and start to slowly build their plan. And I will say on day one, when our instructors came in, everyone just wanted a sheet of paper. Where's the paper? The first question that the men wanted to engage in after we saw the film was, what is the point of incarceration? <laughs> that was it. Why are we doing this? And that was their choice. That's what they wanted to talk to you for about for an hour and a half. And you know that that's so fundamental. And from my, from my, and I'm not an academic nor an expert, but from my my like humble understanding, the original idea was you go and you sit and think on your sins. Thought stuff to be given the skills, you know, like this is a this is this is a way for us not to just sit and kill time, like for the men, a lot of. They were trying to figure out, um, and I can say as a Hawaiian, you know, to go back to this idea of sovereignty and identity, um, so much of what we're dealing with is post-colonization. Mm -hmm. um, these are the ramifications of cultural erasure, mm -hmm. and as a, you know, we're not federally recognized. And Hawaiians are not federally recognized, so we do not exist. Um, we don't have the same sort of recognition that the, that Native Americans experience in the continental U.S. and that that comes down to the fact that we had our own existing monarchy and our own our own internationally recognized government prior to occupation. I'm not, and I'm not an expert on these things, you know, as a filmmaker, but I can say like the statistics and the that have been bad for a very long time. Mm -hmm. And that influenced the choice to just tell the story about what it means as a human to try and build your life back up again in this setting. Um, because the statistics, as you've said, like they don't they don't sway the mind and the heart. But when you actually get to see what it is for somebody to try and come back from it firsthand, that's that makes a difference. So I don't know if that answered your question per se, but um, I would say that this is a very complex and difficult problem. What gets us to where we are today is the product of the intersection of many things, and I think there are going to be many important solutions to make this better. I just add one thing because I want to just—you said something really important. I think we shouldn't we shouldn't skirt around it, 
right? And that is that there, there is such a thing as social harm in our communities. People do get hurt from drugs, from violence, and we want to be careful not to pretend that there's nothing wrong going on in certain communities. And I think like, and it's a very important point, and it's critical to this question of do we reform something, do we abolish it, how do we deal with social harm? And I guess I would ask us to, to actually use that phrase instead of crime, instead of criminal, instead of uh, you know, all the different kinds of racialized language that people use to describe those who commit illegal acts, but to think about social harm and why social harm happens in certain places and not in others, right? And can we as a society <coughs> imagine a different way of dealing with social harm? When somebody steals that loaf of bread, are we gonna treat them as criminals and put them in a cage, right? Or do we think of theft in new ways and try to deal with the problem of poverty? Or to get more real, somebody hurts somebody. If somebody deals drugs and that's hurting the community. How do we actually think about that problem in a way where our, own, our only instinctual answer is not to put a human being in a cage? And you mentioned the history, so I just want to be clear. The history of prison was never good. It hasn't been good since it was founded. The first prisons that were built in Pennsylvania and New York, people went mad in solitary confinement. We know it doesn't work. We, mo we know it traumatizes people. They exploited labor. People rioted. People broke out. When you put human beings in cages, bad things happen to them and to us, all of us, whether we're in the cage or not, right? So how do we think about those kinds of social harms in our community and deal with them in an open and honest way and not pretend they're not there, but without always saying, well, I guess we'll just have to put another human being in a cage. I think we do need to radically rethink how we deal with that. And that's the part of it that's broken. You replace someone back into you. Just so let's just, we're all humans and we all have a heart and we all have a, our brain cells to think. You take someone that was never given a foundation in the beginning. He already is going into a situation thinking he's not love. He has no help, no stability, nothing. And you place him in a cell and you leave him there. So you're placing someone that's going in there already feeling worthless, worthless. You're creating a monster. Fortunately, some of us have a family that we can maybe get a letter from or something that keeps us sane through it. Because even though I sit here to you, I sit here and I tell you there's many nights that I cried myself to sleep because I wanted out of a cell. And I had family that was there for me. And I had to share that experience by looking across the tier to the other cells of guys that didn't have what I had and seeing how they went from being maybe an okay upstanding citizen to coming home and just being angry at the whole world because they was left in a box to rot. So now that you're releasing them from it, it's like, why should I care about anybody or anything? Who cared about me when I was in there? So it's a metaphor of creating someone to put them back into that system. And that's what we need to change. That's where the system is broken because it, it builds a revolving door to continue to bring someone back. And unless you're strong-minded enough, unless you have enough help, you can't break out of that circle. And that's why you have a high recidivism rate. Because why, if you, and this is statistically, like you said, people don't pay attention to numbers. When the schooling was in the prisons, the recidivism rate was lower. Now that they pulled all the schooling out of prisons, the recidivism rate is higher. So it shows you that they're creating a revolving system. And that's the system that's broken that needs to be rehabilitated. Be, uh, that system needs to be abolished and fixed, but not the total system. So we have time for questions from the audience or questions or comments. Yes, there. Thank you. Um, this question is for Ciara. Thanks for your film. Um, I was struck that they were allowed to do their dances in that prison in Arizona. It seems like something, you know, so powerful, like, you know, being in touch with their culture. But, you know, especially the dance, I think David described it as, you know, bombastic and aggressive. Um, you know, that seems like something that might kind of scare the, <laughs> the staff who work in the prison. So what, what's your understanding of why, you know, they were allowed to do that so openly? Um, that's a great question. When we first went into the setting, I, you know, 
I connected with the idea that this was raw and real and honest. And at the same time, we were concerned what an audience's response was to this. Because I didn't, we didn't want people to misunderstand what those bullshits were, right? And what that meant for the men as individuals. <coughs> for the prison itself, there were concerns about what these like we as Hawaiians call them protocols, but like what these pra religious practices meant. And we don't have a Bible or a Quran or any sort of... It actually took several battles to um, just, to get the prison to, or to force the prison to understand onto the right take the prison, which is your right to practice religion. And so despite the fact that the practice itself has an aggressive feel, the men are entitled to this practice because it, their, um, it is their religion. And so the, the prison has to provide that opportunity. Uh, but they did have concerns about gang behavior and did have somebody who they brought in to the prison who was a gang specialist just to ensure that they weren't fostering the creation of a gang. Thank you. Maybe just just to feed on that for you, um, prisoners um, have fought back for their rights for a long time, and that's one right that um, they actually. I hate to say prison. Young men that are being men that are being held incarcerated have fought a long time for all types of rights, and that's one right that has been won. I, I believe throughout the whole United States federally that um, once we can prove that it's a, a legitimate religious practice they can practice it. I mean, when you go inside the prison, you even have people that practice, I believe it's, I hate to use the wrong, like satanic, sin. Wiccan? Wiccan, yeah, Wiccan. Like, once you can prove it's a legitimate religious practice, you're allowed to practice it. You cannot de not be denied your right because it's religion. So that's, uh, like, throughout the United States. Just to build on that, it's important. Maybe there's other connections between the history of Native peoples and African Americans. The Nation of Islam is indispensable to that struggle. Nation of Islam actually, even b before the height of the civil rights movement, was launching these struggles in prison as prison activists for the right to practice their religion. And they fought through multiple cult court battles to get yeah. the, the courts to recognize the right of incarcerated people to practice their religion. So there's some important connections here, too, between different uh, sort of cultural practices of people of African descent and Native Hawaiians. So we have time to just take one last question. Um, hi, I don't have a question per se, um, but I have a statement. Um, first of all, in New York State, that practice would never get done, not New York State prison, because they have, um, they, they have a firmly established um, security concerns and they use it for every little thing to the point where um, people have fought uh, court battles to practice their religion, and um, the authorities fought back and had had um, what they won lowered based on security concerns. That's the first thing. Um, the second thing about uh, abolition, um, I'm a prison abolitionist, right? And what I believe is that, first of all, every single person in prison has has is there because of trauma, right? And if we deal with that trauma, if we um, address that trauma before that person goes to prison, nine times out of 10, they'll never make it there. So when, when talking about getting rid of prison, um, if we think about uh, uh, just getting rid of prisons, like, like we're gonna set up the system and we're gonna get rid of prisons, but then you know, a short period of time, that, even if we could do that, it wouldn't work. We have, what we have to do and start addressing the trauma of, of the, for instance, in New York State, we know that New York State prison is comprised of, seven, of people that come from seven neighborhoods or from seven areas, right? Um, we know what happens in these areas. We, know, we also know that what goes on in these areas is, 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 um, is done by design. It happens by design. It's not happenstance, it happens by design. So when we start helping these people, for instance, um, poverty is not neglect. Right, 
And when we start looking at things from that perspective and we start helping people and addressing their trauma, then and only then can we can really look at and start talking about abolishing prisons. All right, so thank you so much for staying. Uh, thank you to the filmmakers. Thank you to thank you. the presenters. Um, thank you for coming out. Yeah, thanks.